Welcome everyone. Bienvenidos. Klimak Olal. Thank you very much for joining us today in the webinar C19RM and the importance for key populations to get involved in the process. As many of you around the world are aware, COVID-19 has greatly affected our communities. And today we partner with MPAC, NSWP, INPUT, GNP, the LAC platform and the CRG department of the Global Fund to bring you some information about how to get involved, what you can do, and to possibly answer the questions you might have. So please make use of the question and answer button and you can post your questions there. We will try to answer your questions live, but if we don't have the opportunity to answer all of them live, we will at least answer in writing in the Q&A chat. So welcome everybody. Today we have uh, Jill, Mick, Johnny and Anwar who will be our panelists sharing and speaking on different topics. And to start the discussion right away, I'm gonna ask Jill to start sharing an introduction on C19RM and what the Global Fund and the whole partnership is doing and what you can expect, Jill. Thank you very much to the organizer. Thank you, Erika, for the introduction. Uh, can you please confirm, Erika, if you can see my slide? Yes, we can. Perfect. So I will, I will continue. First, I was very impressed with the video, so it will help me to keep within my 10-minute slot. Thank you very much. There was already a lot of information. I encourage you to watch this video again. It's really great work. Um, so just a quick, quick update. So as you know, we, we are here because we received 3.5 billion from the US government and 140 million euro from Germany. So in total we have 3.7 billion US dollar uh, to respond to the impact of COVID-19 in, in, our, in our communities. And so this is really a great opportunity and a very large uh, amount of funding. Who is eligible? Uh, Every country receiving currently uh, global fund grants uh, is eligible uh, and they have received allocation letters on the 8th of April, so they are co country coordinating mechanisms. Um, the investments are eligible are across three main categories. The first one is what we call pure COVID-19 response. The second one is uh, COVID-19 adaptations of programs to fight HIV, TB and malaria. And the last one is strengthening health in community system. But what is really important on that slide is that community responses should be found across all these different intervent areas and not only in the community systems uh, area. Also, what is important to note is that this mechanism is not going to be used to support uh, procurement of vaccines. So like I said, the allocation letters were sent to the country coordinating mechanisms in, the, in all the countries or the regional mechanisms. And basically, uh, what we can anticipate per country is approximately 30%, 30% of the HIV, TB, and malaria allocation. So that's 15%, which is guaranteed as the C19RM based allocation, and another 15%, uh, which we ask country to submit as an above base allocation. And so what we can anticipate is that more or less each country will receive 30% plus or minus, depending on some qualitative factors, adjustment factors. There are two ways to submit funding requests. It was also mentioned in the video, the fast track funding request and the submission windows. The fast track can be submitted at any point in time and is only for communities, commodities like PPE, masks, for example, diagnostics and therapeutics like oxygen. As you know, if we are following what's happening in India, it's really a critical need in many countries. This can be submitted at any point in time. And then we have these four windows, uh, the first one 14th of May, and then every 15 days after that until the end of June, where the CCMs uh, need to register and submit their, uh, their funding requests. In terms of implementation, implementation arrangements, the, the principal recipients uh, will remain the same for this additional funding. But I wanted to highlight here that when there is a need for a particular expertise uh, in a particular area, which is not covered by existing PRs or SRs, it's totally fine to propose new implementers, maybe as, as, a, as service providers, for example, or maybe as sub-recipients or sub-sub-recipients of the current grants to just to make the process easier, but it's possible. And I will come back to that a little bit later. Community engagement is key. You've seen that on the video. 
Uh, it's a requirement, it's an eligibility requirement of each funding request uh, that we are going to receive. We are going to check that. And, uh, and this time around, compared to last year, which was not the case, the CCM engagements should also expand to include communities most severely affected by COVID-19. So beyond the traditional HIV, TB, and malaria communities. Very quickly, I had some uh, lesson learned from last year. We did a survey with the, uh, that we sent to the civil society and communities. And uh, I'm just gonna go quickly because I don't have time. But basically some lesson learned from last year, we, we, we've seen that there is a need to improve information sharing within the CCM, number one, but also outside of the CCM with the broader constituency. Um, we also need to maintain the engagement of civil society and community throughout the process and not only at the very beginning, also until the proposal writing and budgeting, because only 15% or 14% of you last year responded that they were engaged in the writing and budgeting. And so this is a missed opportunity for our priorities to be considered until the last, the last day. Also last year, what we realized is that 32% of the current CCM members who were supposed to sign off on the funding request did sign off, but haven't seen the, the final draft. So this is really problematic. So there is a need to ensure this informed signed off. So please work with the CCM secretaries to, to, to ask them uh, to request that, you know, the final draft are shared with everybody at the CCM. Uh, well in advance before it's submitted to the Global Fund, and please report any engagement bottlenecks, like also it was mentioned in the video that you have seen. And, and finally, we need to support prioritization discussion because half of you last year responded in the survey that the key priorities were not included in the funding request. So clearly we have tried to do that, but there is no magic bullet, and I will now go to some of the some examples of what we have tried to do this time to support a, a more a better meaningful engagement of communities so first there is uh, additional support this year that we obtained from the crg strategic initiative uh, team uh, and and partners uh, which are going to provide technical assistance and and support to uh, key and global population networks and, and organizations and crg regional platforms to basically work on situation analysis and need assessment. This is very important to inform uh, the funding request and also to help the engagement during the dialogue process. So really to help you know, inform priorities for the funding request. So please contact the CRG regional platform uh, and, uh, and this email here, the global fund, which is indicated on that slide, you will have the presentation later. The key population networks and the CRG regional platforms will also help uh, in country with in country consultation, they will help to develop and disseminate information. We've seen the example of the video right now in this webinar. They will convene these regional webinars as well. And they will also help with the prompt feedback to, to us, to the Global Fund Secretariat on engagement bottlenecks. So please contact the key population networks and CRG regional platforms as soon as you encounter any, any engagement bottleneck in the process. We have also secured additional CCM funding for the CCM Secretariat. They can request this funding, and this funding is really aimed at uh, engaging more communities and, uh, and, and, and stakeholders in general. We have also updated the technical guidance and all the templates. There is a specific technical information note on community systems and responses. I will get to it in a few minutes to improve community engagement. We have uh, added in the uh, list of eligible interventions. There are 18 in total in the modular framework. Uh, six of them, six out of 18 in total, are actually CRG-related interventions, which you can see here. I'm not going to read all of them in the interest of time. But just to say that we have tried to make more visible uh, CRG in general in the, uh, in, in, in the C19 RM 2021. And I wanted to show you this because this is just from the funding request template, all the sections that are new and where actually you see there is an emphasis, an emphasis on, on key populations, on civil society, and vulnerable population. And so, you know, this is really, again, to say that we have tried to increase the visibility. So the CCMs will have to respond to all these questions, meaning they cannot ignore your requests and your needs and, and challenges, and they need to be, to be addressed. And finally, this is just this, uh, uh, I wanted to just introduce you to this uh, um, guidance, which is available on the, on the website of the Global Fund in the C19RM section of the website. This is really a guidance, which is kind of a non-exhaustive list of examples of activities which are eligible and could be included in the funding request. And this is really coming from recommendation from civil society and, and communities. 
It also highlights and gives some of the evidence from, from the UN organization, from Stop TB and others, Women for Global Fund, for example, uh, of, of the impact of COVID on, on communities, and therefore then proposing some uh, examples of how to, uh, to, 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 to respond to these challenges. So, for example, community uh, based organizations, just for them to continue their work. Uh, and one important aspect here that we are proposing here is really to equip the CBOs with the mask, the PPE, to ensure that you have the means to continue working, but also in terms of communication means. You need, you need to continue to be able to communicate, to work together, uh, to participate in the process. So all of this is, of course, eligible and should be requested if necessary. Social protection and mental health, and uh, we all know that it's been uh, COVID-19 the inequities uh, and, and push of our communities to, to poverty. Support is eligible. I want to highlight a of this guidance that you will find, where you have the um, the um, uh, criteria for, for eligibility for nutritional support. We cannot expect the funding request to be only about nutritional support, but it is it is eligible. Also, poor mental health activities are are, are eligible. Uh, this is the NXA that I just mentioned, but you will you will find it on the on the document itself, which kind of provides some uh, you know uh, uh, criteria uh, to consider when you when you propose these interventions around nutritional support and social protection. Community-led activities. There are some examples here: monitoring the impact of COVID-19 on health services, for example, also on stockouts, on human rights violations. Um, and all, all the other means. So there is also the uh, to expand the provision of community-led HIV, malaria, and TB testing for COVID-19 uh, and future vaccine and therapeutics, for example. So there's a, a lot of opportunity to engage more community uh, responses uh, and community-led activities. And then finally, we have a, a section in this guidance on uh, intimate partner violence and GBV. We know that it's been a dramatic increase in GBV IPV worldwide. We also know the impact that GBV has on uh, risk of uh, HIV acquisition and also on poor health outcomes for people living with HIV. So it's important that these requests respond to, to this situation. And for example, uh, it's possible to, it's eligible to increase funding for the, or, or, or the capacity of existing helplines for IPV and GBV in countries, because they help a lot with referrals and also to, uh, to respond to the survivors and victims and guide them through their process. So, this is an example of what I mentioned a bit earlier about a new uh, implementer that can be added, for example. Uh, most of our current grants at the Global Fund do not include uh, helplines for, for GBV. They are not receiving funding, but this is definitely a possibility to add them in the, uh, in the response and in the funding request. Um, and so really, like this is the last slide for, for the key messages that, of course, meaningful uh, community engagement is key all the way to the process until writing and budgeting. I mentioned the, the TA support, which is available to conduct all these activities, uh, that it's possible to engage new expert implementers. And, uh, and it's really an opportunity to strengthen community systems and responses. So we hope that we will see more investment proposed in the funding request C19RM 2021. Thank you very much. And I don't know why it's in Spanish, but uh, well, it's in Spanish, gracias. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jill. And just a reminder for everyone who is joining us, thank you from all the countries and the organizations you have joined us. I've been watching your comments from where you're joining us. Uh, please, if you have any questions uh, for Jill, post them in the Q&A or for any of the other presenters, we will go to questions and answer after we finish with all the presentations. Um, a lot of you have been asking about the sharing the PowerPoints, the presentations. We will make sure they are shared. At the end, we will tell you where they can be accessed. Um, and apologies for the persons who were requesting simultaneous transfer, translation into French and Spanish. Um, if you deem it necessary that we organize something in different language, please let us know. We will make sure to do it. Uh, we're going to go ahead with the next presenter, Mick Matthews, who's going to share with us about the importance of community engagement. Mick. Thanks, Erica. Um, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, community engagement, and it's split into two parts, really. Why participate and how to engage. And, you know, the concept of community engagement 
didn't exist in the first round of the Global Fund's COVID-19 response. We were just invisible. It was like we don't exist. So perhaps the question we should ask ourselves is not why participate, but what happens if we don't participate? And this is what will happen. The funding request submitted by your country CCM will de be developed without input from communities or key populations. Any community needs that are included will be identified by people who are not from the communities, who understand almost nothing about the realities and needs and challenges that criminalized populations are facing in this time of COVID. Communities will continue to be denied access to social protection mechanisms, continue to experience increased stigma and discrimination and violence, and to be targeted by law enforcement. Choices and decisions will be made for us, not with us. The funding will once again be distributed amongst and by governments and large NGOs who are not from our communities or not even bona fide HIV, TB or malaria constituencies. And the funding will go to those considered safe, those who are not us. And if we don't participate, we will remain invisible. And without a voice, in a response to a virus that has hit all our communities extremely hard. But I know, and you all know, that participation is not a given, is not easy or straightforward. In fact, it is most often very the opposite of easy. It's really, really hard. But given the impact of COVID, don't you think that we have an obligation to try and participate. So we participate to try and ensure our communities get access to PPE, that there are responses, support, shelters for women who suffer gender-based and domestic violence. And as you, you mentioned, and this has increased exponentially during the lockdowns and the COVID um, restrictions, that human rights of the most vulnerable and marginalized and criminalized are respected within the COVID response and that our communities can get nutrition packages. Now, I know Johnny will take you through a whole range of other things that you may consider a priority for your community during your consultations to develop your C19 submission to the CCN. So I shan't go on about that not anymore. As you've heard, countries have been informed they must consult with key populations and communities, including both CCM and non-CCM representatives. All, fund, all C19 RM funding requests must be endorsed by the entire CCM. And countries, are required to submit a list of all civil society and community proposals in their C19RM funding request. And this should also include those suggestions that were not prioritized and included in the funding request. That is really new. That has never happened before in global fund processes. That's a really positive step. And as a guide, a minimum of, in my opinion anyway, a minimum of 30% of the C19RM funding request should be for key population and community responses. So that is why participate, because if we don't, no one will do it for us. And those of you who know me will also know that I'm often very critical of the Global Fund, but, the community rights and gender team at the Global Fund Secretariat have worked extraordinarily hard to try and push open doors of opportunity in the current C19RM rollout. The doors are not open very wide, obviously, 
but they are open. And this provides opportunities for our engagement. So what can you do? You can ask for a copy of the C19 RM allocation letter that's been sent to your country. Just by doing that, we'll throw the CCM into a panic and they'll be thinking, oh, communities know about this. We need to get our act together. So there is value in asking to see a copy of that C19 RM allocation letter. Inform your CCM through the Secretariat or whichever that your community would like to be involved in all C19 RM related consultations and dialogues. Ask to be put on the mailing list for all C19 RM communications. Request your CCM submit their funding request in the later windows to allow for proper community input. Now, that, that bit of advice might be a bit late for many of you, especially those in countries who are submitting in uh, Windows 1 and po po probably Windows 2 as well. But it's still good information, um, good advice. If your CCM wants to urgently submit their funding request because of the emergency in the country, request they split their submission, like Jill explained. Submit the first, which is for the commodities, in the fast track request, followed by the full request after a transparent and meaningful consultation with key populations. Try to get involved in CCM led situation and needs assessments and in all of the C19RM country dialogues. I'm not going to say definitely get involved because I know that might be difficult in some countries, but at least try. Organise consultations and reach out and collaborate with other key populations or with your own community to provide input for the C19 RM funding request. Document your needs, priorities and recommendations in a proposal for inclusion to the C19 RM funding request and submit to your CCM and also share this with the global key population networks. Ask that the key population CCM representatives do not sign the C19RM funding request if key populations have not been involved. Now, I also know that's quite a difficult thing for many people, um, but if you can, and if they can refuse to sign unless key populations have been properly involved, that is a good thing. Me? Yep. You have two minutes. Okay. Well, I'm coming to the end now. Okay, I'll be quick. Just a few other things that may help with your engagement. The Global Key Population Networks are committed to supporting you and are available to answer questions and provide guidance. The regional platforms are also available for the same and may be able to help facilitate access to technical assistance. The Global Fund have developed a number of tools and guides, and these are available on the Global Fund website. But if you find the website too complicated to negotiate, and you may well, um, all the key documents and tools, including those developed by communities, are also on the Key Populations webpage, which is currently hosted by NSWP. A Key Populations briefing note produced by the Global Networks is being disseminated in English, Russian, French, and Spanish, and possibly other languages, I'm not sure, but hopefully. And finally, as a minimum and realistically, inform your CCM in whatever way you can that you want to be involved and will be submitting a proposal. Try and find out the timeline and format for getting your submissions in. Identify your community priorities through a consultation, either face-to-face -face or virtual. Prepare your submission it's better if it includes an indicative budget and make sure it gets in on time and document everything that you do. It's a lot of work in a very short space of time. So good luck and gracias. Thank you very much, Mick. 
And um, we're gonna continue with the next presenter, Johnny. And meanwhile, Johnny uploads his presentation. I want to acknowledge, because um, I received a couple of messages that we have an all male panel. Um, I want to apologize uh, because we didn't think about having more diversity with our speakers today, but I promise that being the woman moderator in the group, I will keep them under control. <laughs> Go ahead, Johnny. Thank you, Erica. Can you hear me well? Yes, And you can. you can see my screen? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Uh, I'll try to keep it brief and direct and uh, talk specifically about some uh, examples or recommendations for uh, programs that communities, as they're engaged in this process, can uh, recommend or suggest to be included in their country's application. As Mick has mentioned, we encourage you to advocate for, uh, you know, a clear and significant uh, amount to go for KP programming and not just to go for KP programming, to go to the hands of KP communities, because sometimes also governments uh, want to take that money and say, we will use it for KP programming. So make sure that communities also are supported. Um, All right, um, you know, it is very important to, um, to have communities engaged in this process and uh, to, to ensure that the response to COVID-19 um, uh, does not aggravate discrimination against the population as we've seen so far in a lot of, in a lot of countries. Uh, we are gonna present here um, um, just a general list of concrete activities that would address community related challenges, but also that doesn't mean that these are the only activities that can be suggested. Um, and these were based on um, consultations that the CRG department have done with communities as well as communities own KP consultation that happened um, and can be used directly by um, you know, a civil society or the CCM as they're doing negotiation around the funding request. Um, one of the first thing we can look at is adaptation of any existing programs before we start looking into new programs. Um, for example, um, if there are any programs that are happening right now for uh, delivering services or programs um, targeting KP population, uh, key populations, um, one of the activities that you can do is to assess how much these services and programs are safe and secure for uh, the vulnerable population, considering what's going on with COVID-19 and the restrictions around that, um, as well as any, any efforts to change policies or revise them based on um, COVID-19 response. So uh, there would be an easier access to services for HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. Uh, we've seen some of that already happening and we've been advocating for governments to keep it going. For example, multi-month dispensing of medication. Um, so um, these are some of the, so they might need to be a policy change to, to keep that uh, within the country response. And this is an activity that could be, um, that you could call for in this application as well as uh, support costs for um, programmatic adaptation uh, as we've seen, we've been moving a lot, some of our work from face-to-face uh, -face into the virtual space. So that might mean that you need to uh, uh, do any type of training or sensitization, even for staff or for communities to be able to engage in the virtual space. Um, for community-led uh, delivery of services, um, you can think about uh, strengthening community platforms that are currently in the country, like drop-in center or any safe spaces or community clinics. Uh, think about expanding um, rapid testing to COVID-19 or as vaccines and other therapeutics start coming into your country, how that could be uh, provided to communities um, as well as other uh, related activities like case finding and screening. Uh, any activities related to uh, uh, addressing stigma and discrimination uh, with healthcare workers, uh, especially those that are going to be leading the work in the COVID-19 response. So, um, so, so you can ensure that KP communities can uh, 
can access those services without any structural barriers or stigma and discrimination, um, as well as any awareness raising on uh, on, on rights violation against the population. Um, you can you can work with that. Um, one of the important things that we've been calling for a very very long time is to have communities engaged in in, in monitoring and more specifically you know we call it community-led monitoring so here is another area um that you could um think about activities to include uh, like monitoring the impact of COVID 19 uh, uh to to develop any advocacy materials uh um in terms of any policies that need to be changed changed or uh, in relation to uh, access to services uh, keeping an eye on stockouts and human rights violation reporting on that so monitoring that situation as well as um, invest in the integration of community-based education and advocacy uh, and educating people uh, especially when you see a high level of vaccine hesitancy um, Another area of support is around intimate partner violence, gender-based violence. We've seen a lot during the COVID-19, uh, you know, the, the whole, as it swept the world uh, between last year and this year, we, we heard a lot from our communities about increased incidence of intimate partner violence, gender-based violence, and how, um, you know, people who are faced with this violence are even forced to stay at home, uh, to 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 not able to leave um, abusive households and uh, there are a lot of other repercussions to that as well that we're going to talk about. But in terms of uh, gender-based violence and intimate partner violence, you can think about how to raise awareness uh, around prevention. Um, you can invest in uh, enhancing any existing uh, helplines around that. Uh, any any referral system that are existing in your country around um, these type of violence, as well as um, if there the need for uh, post exposure prophylaxis for those who who needed uh, emergency contraception or any other emergency services, uh, including uh, psycho social support and mental health um, or trauma services. Um, also, training healthcare workers, law enforcement on the increased risk of uh, intimate partner violence and gender-based violence uh, during these times. Yes. Two minutes. I'll make it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, you can also think about how to support CBO's engagement in prevention and service delivery, uh, equipping them with the PPE material, with PPE, um, any prevention information uh, to mobile population or minorities and indigenous people, um, community mobilization, uh, uh, and, and monitoring and strengthening linkage to HIV and tuberculosis services. Um, you can support access to services for people in prison and what comes with that in terms of commodities as well. Uh, producing data packs and IT support for communities so they can be more, more engaged in processes and uh, procuring phones and data credits. As we've seen, communities are getting more and more engaged in virtual spaces and they will need that type of a baseline support. And finally, in terms of social protection and mental health, uh, you can think about nutritional support and other livelihood packages, um, uh, scaling up rapid uh, response mechanism, uh, for example, temporary shelters, um, services supporting people with disabilities, uh, building on any current infrastructure for vulnerable populations so they can support each other, like support groups, uh, whether it's face-to-face -face or virtual, and social mobilization education of communities, as well as uh, mental health support. Um, so we will send this presentation, as, as Erica mentioned, and thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Johnny, for sharing a lot of examples and guidance of what kind of activities can be included in C19 or M requests. And it will help uh, key populations and the networks uh, to be able to have uh, discussions and prioritize these activities. We're gonna continue with our last uh, panelist uh, who is from the LAC Regional Platform. Anwar will be sharing with us uh, what uh, the opportunities that are being offered and the 
of um, the activities that are being supported by the LAC platform, particularly around technical assistance requests. Anwar, you can go ahead. Hi, and thank you very much for the invitation. So as Gil said, uh, the regional platforms, we were asked to provide uh, support in, to the countries in order to ensure the community engagement in two ways to, uh, as you mentioned, Erica, to uh, prepare technical assistance requests to the CRG program and to provide uh, direct support to, um, to ensure that their national consultations among the communities uh, take uh, place in, in, the, in, the, in the country. So what I am gonna share with you this morning is some lesson learned from the process that we are implementing in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I hope that it can be useful for the processes. So we are in the middle of the very fast process. So we all, we need to move very quickly. Sometimes I'm droning and others are flying, you know? The countries that are uh, choosing to apply for the Windows 1 and 2, they are flying, but the countries that are applying for Windows 3 and 4, they are just running. We have new challenges because even that the, some CCMs are familiar with the inclusive processes of the communities, the issues of COVID-19 still having new programmatic aspects as, as Johnny and Mike uh, mentioned it. So we choose to provide tools to help to improve the understanding of, of and, and, and help to the people that is facilitating the process of consultation to move faster in this new uh, scenario. Something that we learn is that this is a very complex process. And this complex process needs a very strong coordination because there are too many cooks in the kitchen, you know? We are us providing technical assistance, but there are also the people from the CCM, but also there are some external consultants from UNAID, for, from, from PAHO, from many other agencies that are providing support in the preparation of the request. So it is very important to maintain a strong communication channels with the CCM, but also with other stakeholders that are working in, in, in at the same time in the same task. We learned also that it is very important to approach to the CCM in order to ensure that, the, uh, that we have the updated information about the community that are involved in the processes of the development of the funding request. And sometimes we have uh, some information, but in sometimes the, the representatives from key population, from the disease, they are changing very quickly. So we need to ask into the CCMs if we have the right uh, information. So also the CCM, especially the, the uh, secretariats has a very, very specific lead uh, role in the process of the construction of the request. So it is very important to maintain informed to the CCM what we are doing. That can help also to ensure that once the consultations finish, the inputs from the community could be integrated harmonically in the, in the request. And that it can happen if we have a very good communication with the CCMs. No, in most of the countries, they have a critical path. So it is very important for us to know what are the timing, because in sometimes we have to know at the exact moment in where the teams are working in a specific task. So it is very important for us in the planification of the, of the consultations or other activities to know what is the critical path and what is the critical moments for the for the participation of the communities and the and the net and the key population networks. This is a very diverse process. In each country, there are many, many communities that need to be involved. For example, in, in, in this call, 
there the global fund is is recommending and in some time is, is uh, also uh, requiring the inclusion of the people affected by covid-19 and in some countries in some countries that it can be a challenge because we are very very you know comfortable working with the 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 the, the key population that we already know that are in the in the field, you know, with people affected by HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, and included the new actors can be a challenge, but it is necessary to, to explore that kind of things. So the big challenge is to integrate everyone in the, in the conversation and provide the spaces for er that everyone can uh, provide the, the input that is needed. For the support for the technical assistance applications, we, um, we learned that this best suited uh, that uh, option for people for countries that are choosing um, Windows uh, three and four because they have more time. You know, they 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 they, they, they the the option of the technical assistant. There are a little bit more complex processes for gathering, um, you know, evidence or, or to elaborate um, um, rapid needs assessments or to organize. Um, national consultations. For countries that are applying for Windows 1 or 2, we think that the direct support from the platform to, to, to contract and a specific consultant that provide the support for organizing, facilitating and produce the recommendations and the identify the priorities to communicate to the team that is pro, uh, preparing the financial support is better for us. So something that also we learned, and this is my last line, is we learned that working together, it is something that we need to do. We learned that, the, that if we work with the uh, CRG components one and two, such as the technical system providers, the key population networks, and the, and the platforms, it's, it's a very good way to work because in that way, we ensure that everyone is working in the same, in, in the same direction. We produce a very um, um, interesting tool to accompany the process of the consultations. We are just in the finish, finish and the final details before we launch it. But as soon as it's ready, we will share with you and a toolkit where you can find all the key documents related with the C19 RM and also some advices to facilitate the process to organize the results of the consultations and to prepare the report and to connect the findings or the priorities that the community identified to the, 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 the team that is working in the, in the funding request. Um, and I think that's it. And um, for me, it's, it, it's it that I want to share. Um, Sorry for my bad English, <laughs> my Latin. You did great. You did great, Anwar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for all our panelists, Gilles, Mick, Johnny, and Anwar. And we're going to proceed to some question and answers. Um, we had several questions uh, in the Q&A uh, uh, chat box, and some of them have been answered, but I do, there are some of them that I really want to just have some of the panelists answer verbally because they're very important questions. Um, so there is a question about nutritional packages. Um, the person says that they only found that in the modular framework in the case of gender-based violence. Is that something that can be provided to key populations and people with HIV? Whoever wants to take that question, go ahead, Shirt. I can I can try to answer that quickly. Oh, Jill, if you want, maybe. Um, but also, I want to take this opportunity to say that in around five minutes, I unfortunately need to leave this call to get on another call, so I apologize. Um, and maybe and um, just for the question, and uh, Jill, please feel free to correct me. Um, you could uh, uh, you could include activities for nutritional or livelihood packages. Uh, for key population and people living with HIV uh, in your application and not just in relation to gender-based violence. Uh, is that correct, Jill? Yes, Johnny, absolutely. This is correct. Uh, and I would go a little bit beyond. Uh, we talked about nutritional support and livelihood packages, but 
Um, we've seen some requests even last year, uh, and India was an example where the request was actually more like a cash uh, cash transfer to uh, to clients or or some populations rather than uh, than food. Just taking into account that you know pe people may not need food, but they may need something else. So it's it's it encompasses a little bit broader. Thank you. That is very clear. So the, I'm gonna. Uh give three questions now because they are related and uh, any of the panelists can feel free to answer. So there's one question, how will the community-based organization benefit? That's a very straight to the point. How, what's the benefit for the community-based organizations? Um, the other second question, as civil society participate in the proposal, are, are they supported with data packages to get into virtual calls when necessary or transportation fare to go where the writing team is. And the third one is if a country CCM is refusing or neglecting to engage civil society in the process, is there a grievance settlement mechanism? I can respond quickly to the CCM question on the means to be engaged. So yes, absolutely we have we have provided made available for CCM secretariats in all the countries, 25% of their 2021 grant budget. And this is exactly for that. They should apply for this funding and this funding can be used to, you know, provide phones or I don't know, internet credits or whatever data credits to, uh, for people, especially from communities and civil society to be engaged during the process. So yes, uh, but please get to your CCM secretariat and tell them to make the request and to ask for this money uh, to the Global Fund Secretariat. And then quickly on the CCM, uh, if the CCM is not responding, doesn't want to include, uh, I think it's been mentioned by many of the panelists, you, you have these emails, your contact, the key population network, the CRG platform, your country team at the Global Fund, us also at the CRG department, please don't let this uh, go unnoticed. You need to report it as soon as possible, as soon as it happens with the name of the country, what happens, uh, we need to verify this and, uh, and then we need to act and we will act. We will not let this happen. So please report any engagement bottlenecks. Thank you very much, Gilles. Anwar, Mick, do you want to add something to the questions? Uh, the, about how communities benefit. Um, well, I thought I covered that a little bit, um, but you know, the thing is, you benefit, communities will benefit by funding being directed to community led organizations. You will benefit from uh, having resources to develop, for example, to develop temporary shelters for um, people who are impacted by uh, domestic violence. Um, you'll be able to get nutrition packages as has just been mentioned you know it's difficult to to say <laughs> to bring out a whole list of how communities will benefit because it will differ in each country but i think if you look at the the tools you look at the presentations about what's possible you can see where communities will be able to benefit if if those things are included and i think jill wants to um add to that Go yes, thank ahead, you Mick. Thank you, Erika. Thank you, Mick. Yes, just to add to what Mick said, there are 18 interventions in total in the modular framework in the budget of this funding request. Six of them are CRG related and four out of the six are community system threatening activities. So this is also how the CBO, the local in-country CBOs can benefit from this mechanism because four of the 18 interventions are community system funding, community-led monitoring financing, institutional capacity building of community-led organizations, et cetera. So, you know, the opportunity is there. I like what Mick said earlier that the door now is not widely open, but it's open. And now it's really for, for you to use, to use that door. Thank you very much, Jill. Anwar? Yes, I, I think this is a very complex process. And, and I think that this uh, support to to organize uh, the consultation is crucial in order to support community to think strategically. What is this the, in, in the menu, <laughs> in the big menu and all that documents that we are available, 
what it is the most important things that we have to think to prioritize. So this exercise to prioritize and to discuss the mix according with the national context, because each country is affected in a different way for the COVID. So I think to use that spaces to discuss the needs and the priorities, it is something that it can be a great contribution for the country in order to ensure that the requests are included, not the essential medical uh, uh, issues that the country needs, but also can ensure that the community's activities and the community approaches are included. So I think this process of consultation, it is a crucial part of the process. And this is so new for, 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 for the way that we are used to working. So we have to learn also from the process. Thank you very much. Um, yes, there's the comment again about all the panelists being men. Apologies once more. Um, you are totally right. Big, big mistake from us, the organizers. Um, believe me, I, it, it, we take it very serious. Uh, um, your feedback is taken seriously. Um, uh, and we will try to engage more diversity in future webinars. Uh, so there's two more questions. Um, so uh, the question is, can communities submit their own proposals, example, sex workers, MSM, PLHIV separately, or do they need to do it as a group of civil society? Yeah, I'd like to weigh in on that one before some of the others. I mean. I think you have to be realistic. And, and I think there's also a question from Singapore that also talked about what do you do if you're being excluded? Can you submit um, on your own? You know, the, the point is if when the, when the um, funding request arrives at the Global Fund, if yours is separate, it won't be looked at. In reality, it won't be looked at. The thing is, if you're being excluded or it doesn't, not, there's nothing to stop you doing your own consultation and coming up with your own priorities, but you need to share them and need to coordinate with the other key population groups in your country. Because if you submit together, and that doesn't mean replacing your priorities, but just adding your priorities to what's being submitted you have a much much stronger chance of them being assessed positively when the funding request goes into the global fund if you do it separately you reduce the chances of having any success that would be my response to that thank you gavin anybody wants to add something else yes go ahead anwar what we are learning in the process is that in, is, is depending the context of the country. Because in some countries, there are some, some communities are choosing to have a single consultation with all the communities in the dialogue, in the discussion. But in other countries, they are asking to, to, to organize separate uh, uh, mini dialogues among uh, specific uh, key populations or by disease, you know? It is very often that the, the people that, that is working in tuberculosis wants in a specific space and the people that are working with HIV wants in a specific space or the group of the key populations want a specific space, but the, the relevant is what makes it. It is very important that at the end, all the needs of the different uh, communities of the sectors of the community, can be agreed in a single document, the, 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 the whole priorities, and they be agree that the, the, this is the priorities that the country needs, not each one of the sector of the community needs, you know? So that is very important, coordinate and working together. Well said, Anwar. It always makes it stronger if we collaborate. And, and when it's possible, let's try to do so. Um, I see that we have uh, two final questions. 
um, those civil society application, and I think they meet the submission, needs to be approved by the CCM. What is the process? So if we can answer that uh, very shortly. And how does one ensure that priorities are not watered down during the grant making as observed in the past? We're gonna take these last two questions. So yes. anybody? Maybe I will respond to that, Erika. Um, so there is only one request going to the Global Fund Secretariat, and that's the request coming from the CCM. So there are not multiple requests at the same time being developed and being submitted to the Global Fund Secretariat. There is one request which includes the, hopefully includes the priorities of all the constituencies, governments, partners, you know, so civil society communities, right, key populations. Um, so yes, just to clarify that the mechanism is not, you know, that each constituency submit their own funding request. It's one single funding request per country. And sorry, I forgot, Erika, about the, the, the last question. <laughs> but I can look in there. Yes. Um, so it is, uh, it was basically just uh, how, how that, how, how is the process? Uh, which you have already answered because I apologize, I also forgot the, the other question. But yeah, how, to stop it right being, how to stop it being diluted during Thank you, Mick. Break. Yeah. That was, the, that was the other part of the question. How do we how, stop it being diluted in the process? Like, like so, as so often happens with the, with the usual granting, grant making. Yeah. Mick, you want to take that really fast? Um, I, <laughs> I can do. Uh, what I would suggest is when I spoke earlier, I, I said, you know, send the, your submissions to the global net networks. And if you if you find that they have been diluted, that's something we can take up with the global fund. We can inform G, we can inform the CRG, we can inform the country team. Um, I'm not sure otherwise how you can avoid that realistically. I'd like to say something else, but I'm not sure how you can. Maybe Xi has a, a better answer, but I'm not sure there is a better one. No, there is no magic bullet, like I said earlier. And the only magic bullet would have been to have, and it was a question that responded around that, around having a set percentage for communities and key populations in terms of funding, but we don't have that because it's very country specific. And anyway, I don't want to enter in the politics around that, but it's not what has been decided by the board. Um, so there is, let me be very honest. I, have, I cannot guarantee that all your priorities are going to be included in the funding request. There is nobody who can guarantee that. Uh, what we have tried to do, what uh, Anua, Mick, you know, uh, Erika, all the networks, the regional platforms are, are going to provide is support so that you come with one voice, with a clear set of priorities based on evidence, based on data, based on analysis of the situation, and then responding. And, you know, and also what we've done is try to really map out this eligible activity so that at the CCMs, people cannot tell you, oh, but the global fund is not going to accept this or accept that. And, you know, so you have the tools, hopefully, that will help prioritizing, you know, all your interventions. But I have to be honest, I cannot say that there is a guarantee. It really depends on the dynamics at the CCM level and how it happens. What I would recommend you, though, because we have had this course as well with all the partners, and I'm talking about UNICEF, I'm talking about WHO, about UNAIDS, the partners which are sitting at the CCMs, right? They are engaged, and they, they told us that they are like 100% behind communities and key populations. So please go and talk to them as well. Go and talk to them and get their buy-in, you know, get their support during the votes at the CCMs, during the discussion, so that you know, if you are opposed in, in some ways to the government for some activities, whatever, you know, you have like a backup, you have a support from them. They have a voice too. And I know for them, it's also complicated, just like for you sitting at the system in front of the government. Uh, but, you know, I think if you are getting to them, reaching out to them, it would be only added value. Thank, Thank you, Gilles. Go ahead, Anwar. That. I think that is crucial, you know, that way we, we try to coordinate with the CCM and also in, in Latin America with with uh, on United Latina, because these people is 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 leading the process, 
And if we can coordinate since the beginning and explain them the relevance to having the input and the and uh, and the priorities of the community, they will understand and they will accompany the process too. And they 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 will understood more clearly what is important. And at the end, if they understand that the process can be soft, you know, because at the end, the, the, the funding request must to be approved. In some countries, it's through the, the CCM assembly, you know, and if everyone came to this space of uh, decision making with the, all the pieces of information and, and with a clear idea about the process, I think the, the decision making process can be soft, you know, that's why I think that is very important to not go alone. It is very important to coordinate with the key, the stakeholders, all the key actors that are involved in the process. As I said in my presentation, there are many cooks in the kitchen. So it is important to understand what is the role of each one and, and, and coordinate with them in order to, at the end, get the most number, the, 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 the biggest number of the priorities included in the request. Thank you very much. Uh, I recognize we are already 10 minutes over, um, over time, but if you all have five more minutes, I will ask the four questions that are pending uh, really fast and we can answer them and then uh, we can close the webinar. Um, so, there's the question, is it important for us to have CCM approval? And somebody just deleted the question. Um, we may have a need, but national proposals could not cover more where civil society found very essential based on their previous experience. After the country has submitted the request and approved by Global Fund, will there be an RFA in country for organizations to apply? Yeah, I, the first question, um, I actually did a written answer. Um, it was can about you share it they, verbally really fast, Mick, so that other yeah, people whether can they hear need, it. Whether, whether people needed CCM approval before they submitted their submission, you know, to the to the CCM. And I said, no, you don't need CCM approval. I mean, whether the CCM accepts your priorities or not, that's a different question. But you don't need CCM approval before you submit your proposal to the CCM for consideration. And that's why that's why I wrote, well, basically. Thank you. And I noticed there was a question in certain countries where certain key populations are not represented in the CCM. We know it's a, it's a practice that sometimes there's one person to represent all key population networks and organization. Please get in contact. It's important to collaborate and work together in this. But that does not limit your community to submit a uh, prioritization and, and, and um, comments to the CCM. That's yeah, no um, limitation. Any, just, any just to add on, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, Erica, sorry. Oh, okay, um, just, just to add to that, I mean, that's one of the advantages of reaching out to other key population groups. If you're excluded from the CCM, it doesn't mean you're excluded from the process. And you, you can engage with the process by collaborating with other key populations, some one of whom may be represented on the CCM. It's one of the advantages that you get from that collaboration. Thank you very much. And I see a very specific question about uh, a drug policies and criminalization in certain countries being posed there. I, I would suggest, please, please get in contact with the key population network, I am sure that input will be very happy to provide some support and some guidance about how you can go about conducting your consultation and at the same time keeping your community safe. Um, we know this is important, this is urgent, but the safety of our communities is more important than any uh, process uh, that we can think of. Thank you very much to, for the panelists, Anwar, Mick, Jill, and Johnny for joining us today. Thank you for our partners uh, to bring this webinar to you, GNP+, Plus, NSWP, Input, MPAC, and GATE, and the LAC platform. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.